uh, today I want you to look with me at Mark 14, and then we'll have a word of prayer. We're starting a new series of studies on Sunday called Messianic Passovers. We're going to look at the history of the Messianic Passovers and how they were converted under the new covenant uh, to the Eucharist. So I'm looking at the reason I chose Mark 14, even though all four Gospels are going to discuss the Passover in which Christ died, a crucifixional death for our sins. Uh, Mark identifies something very important about what we call the Passover in that the Passover is one day of an eight-day festival. In that eight-day festival are four Jewish holidays. The first day of that festival is called Passover. The next seven days is called unleavened bread. In the middle of unleavened bread, after the weekly Sabbath, the first day of the week is called first fruits. And you start counting from first fruits 50 days off to Pentecost. Those four Jewish holidays were all identified with the first advent of Jesus Christ into the world. Mark identifies that, and that's very important. Sometimes when you study the Gospels, they'll refer to Passover as the eight-day period. Sometimes they'll call it unleavened bread. The truth of the matter is there are four holidays that are really important to the first coming of Christ. And Mark identifies it, and that's the reason I chose <clears throat> Mark 14, 1 and 2, and then verse 12. <clears throat> Here's what Mark says. Now the Passover, that would be the first day, and unleavened bread, that would be seven days, was two days off. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him, Christ, by stealth and kill him. They were saying among themselves, not during the festival, that's Passover unleavened bread, lest there be a riot of the people. So they chose not to do it then. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to do it legally, but they were afraid of it because of the, the holiness of Passover. Now, verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said unto him, where do you want us to go and prepare the place to eat the Passover? And then we go from there into the Last Supper, the Garden of Eden, into the arrest, into the crucifixion of Christ. So I thought it was important for you to understand it because one of the great mistakes, and over the next four Sundays in the month of April, we're going to do a really intense study of the Passover in which Jesus Christ, the historical Passover in which Jesus Christ fulfilled it. And that's very important because there are a lot of mistakes because of people not understanding that about when Christ was crucified, when he was buried, and when he was raised. Almost everybody agrees he was, he was raised on Sunday. But apart from that, there's a lot of confusion, and it could be cleared up if you would understand the his history of the Passover. Let's stop right now. I want to have a word of prayer with you, and then we're going to get into the morning study. Let us pray. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. How you deal with it in the church age is confession. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. The cleansing here goes back to verse 7 where Christ died on the cross to cleanse us from Adam's sin as well as from personal sin of a believer. When a believer is in sin, personal sin, volitional, he confesses it to restore him to spirituality, not salvation. Spirituality, that is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, John 6, 19 and 20. That's a really important principle because during the teaching hour, the Holy Spirit's job, according to John 14, 26, is to teach you the word of God and then to recall it into the application of your life. So let's pause for a moment to give believer priests an opportunity to confess their sin if necessary. That would be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, and overt sins. That's necessary in preparation for proper Bible study. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the perpetuous work of Christ in the 
on the cross that's extended to the believer's life in confession. It allows the cleansing from personal sin to become spiritual people under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not only for study and application of the Word of God, but for the victorious Christian life. I pray today, Father, as we look at Messianic Passovers, that we look at the history behind the Passover to understand the significance of the event and how Christ fulfilled the Passover that began with the exodus of the Israelites from Israel. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now today I want us to take a look at this Passover and unleavened bread. That's an eight-day festival, and it's really important that you understand that. And Mark is dealing with that. There is Passover, that's the first day, which is separate from unleavened bread. There is Passover, and then there is unleavened bread. Passover is one day, and unleavened bread is seven days festival. And it's really important that you know that. This eight-day Messianic festival had four important Messianic holidays. If you have a study guide, then you will see that printed for you. And if you don't have a study guide, then you need a pencil and paper. The four Messianic holidays connected with this eight-day festival, as I mentioned in my introduction, is Passover, the first day, unleavened bread, which is seven more days. In the middle of that seven days, after the weekly Sabbath, on the first day of the week, Sunday, the weekly Sabbath being Saturday, the first day is the first fruits festival. You count 50 days to the fe Feast of Pentecost. That's really important. These four holidays are all connected with the first coming of Christ, and they're interconnected. One leads to another to another. It's really important. I can't begin to emphasize the importance of that. Jesus Christ came into the world to fulfill the Messianic holidays from the hill of Golgotha, John 19, 17, and 18. In Mark 17, 5, 17, in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. That would be the old covenant. I did not come to abolish the old covenant. I came to fulfill it for a new covenant. That's Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. In Paul records in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 4, that Jesus is the end of the law. In Mark, in Luke 24, 41, referring to the first advent of Jesus Christ, the prophecies connected to the first advent, he says that the prophecies connected with Jesus Christ in the Mosaic law the prophets in the Psalms, that's all of the Old Covenant that deals with Messianic prophecies, must be fulfilled. That's Luke's account, verse, uh, chapter 24, 44. So it's really important to know that this his history, the biblical history of Passover, which began with the Exodus, is now going to both be fulfilled in the land, the promised land, it was given in a foreign land, Egypt, is now going to be fulfilled in the promised land on a specific hill called Golgotha. We call it, out of Latin, we call it Calvary. And he is on Calvary and Mount Golgotha as he is being crucified for the sins of the world, he's going to fulfill the shadow Christology of the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. That's really important that you understand the dynamics of the plan of God involved in salvation. Today, I want to look at four aspects of the history of the Messianic Passover. The Jewish Last Supper, the Jewish Last Supper was also officially the last Passover in Messianic history of the first advent. Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper in Luke 22, 19 and 20, how it was going to be changed. He said, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. And, and he said, this is my body. He's holding Passover bread. He's holding the Passover bread 
of unleavened bread, of the feast of unleavened bread, he said, this bread, Passover bread, is my body, the incarnate person body of Jesus Christ. This my body, which is given for you, the word for you is hooper, and it means on behalf of you or in place of you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. That's the Passover cup. After they had eaten, and he said, this cup, which is poured out for you, for you again on your behalf, is the new covenant in my blood. So there's been exchange from the old covenant Passover fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. I can't begin to tell you how important that whole structure is for the church of Jesus Christ, the dynamics of the church of Jesus Christ. At the last Passover, that is the last supper, last Passover of Jesus Christ, Jesus declared the exchange of shadow Christology, old covenant, for Passover, for the Eucharist of historical Christology. When you read Luke 22, 19, and 20, as I just did, you'll see that there was an exchange. The old covenant is now being fulfilled by the coming of Christ, who's going to die on a cross to become the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And there's going to be exchange from the old covenant, that's everything of the old covenant that deals with the first coming of Christ, we call that the Old Testament, is going to be exchanged for the new covenant, historical Christology. We live in the new covenant of historical Christology. We don't live under the old covenant Levitical uh, Exodus system. The old Passover has been exchanged or fulfilled for the new covenant, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. That's the exchange. No longer the lamb, but now the person of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. And so he has. Therefore, at the last Passover, Jesus declared an exchange of shadow Christology for historical Christology. And that's an important part to us because we celebrate it in this church once a month. It's called the Eucharist. It's called the Eucharist. How important is the Eucharist to the church? It is as important to the church as the Passover was to Israel in the Old Covenant. In fact, it is more important. The Eucharist is more important because it has, it, it has swallowed up the Old Covenant Passover and brought in a new dimension. It's called the Eucharist of the church. And it's an enormous, it's an enormous uh, thing. It's one of the highlights of the church is the Eucharist. More than any other ordinance, it's the Eucharist and how dynamic it is. And sometimes we don't understand the historical significance of the Eucharist because we don't understand what it fulfilled. I hope to try to clear that up today. Here's point number two. When you lay this out, and I've laid it out on, a, on your paper, you have the first days called Passover. This next seven days of an eight-day festival is called unleavened bread. Now, in Leviticus 23, in Leviticus 23, verse 5, Passover occurs on Nisan 14. That's a Jewish month. Nice and 14, that's the day. Passover always occurred on a date. The day always changed, like our Christmas on 25. It always stays 25, but the day changes. Passover occurs on a date. Now, that date is important for the death of Jesus Christ, which is going to come after the exodus all the history after the Exodus is important because Jesus has got to die on Nice and 14. 
on a hill called Golgotha in the promised land. That's really important. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, verse 5, declares it. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 declares Jesus is the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul refers to Jesus Christ, the historical person, called biblically the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. He calls him the Passover lamb. When you read the, the account in Exodus, it is interesting in Exodus, the fourth chapter, we'll look at it in a minute that that Passover, the original first Passover, is called the Lord's Passover. It's called the Lord's Passover. That's going to be fulfilled by the Lord on the hill called Golgotha on the 14th of Niacin in 30 A.D. Here's my point to you in a principle. How important is God to the everyday life of a believer? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What day? Every day. He set up the Nicene of 14th as a date, not a day. Now, the 14th of Niacin, he's going to put his son. The Lord's Passover is going to be the Lord's Passover. The prophecy, the shadow Christology, the prophecy of the shadow Christology is going to be fulfilled in the Lord on that specific Passover. And there's going to be an exchange to the new covenant. What a marvelous idea God is in charge of every day of your life. You need to know that, and you need to submit to that. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. Every day is the Lord. We learn that from the story of creation every day. Every day. And nothing could be more true, even for the Lord Jesus Christ, once he took on the humanity of man. Every day, he's got to say to himself in his humanity through the word of God working in his soul, this is the day the Lord has made. I must rejoice and be glad in it. How important is that principle to your life? So on the 14th of Niacin, on 30 AD, Christ is nailed to a cross on a hill called Golgotha on the 14th of Niacin. And he's going to remain on that cross the whole day until it's time to take him down at the end of the day. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. How do we know which day? We know the date. That's indisputable. The date is indisputable. Nice and 14. Every Passover, every Passover since 1440 B.C., has been on Nice and 14th, the first day, which opened up a seven-day festival. And no different that day on the hill called Golgotha. He's going to be crucified, and then we start the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is recorded in Leviticus 23, 6 through 8, and it occurs from the 15th, through the 21st of Nisan, right? 14 is Passover, 15 through 21, that's seven days, is unleavened bread. It was recorded that way. It was, it was decreed by God to be that. Those are dates. Those are dates. It's important you understand that. Why? Because listen to me, and listen to me closely. Next week, I'm going to bring this out, and I'm going to show you all the errors of it today. 15th, 16th, and 17th 
Jesus is buried in Sheol. Did you get that? Going to die on 14. That's the prophecy fulfillment since 1440 B.C. And then he's going to be buried. He's going to be buried for three days, 15, 16, 17. Now we know days. We got dates and days. On the 18th, on the 18th is going to be Sunday. Because we got Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The weekly Sabbath is 17. The next day after that is called the high Sabbath of first fruits. That's important. Also, what's important, according to Leviticus, according to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, 7 and 8, the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th, and the 21st, the last day of unleavened bread, are called holy convocations. They're called high Sabbaths in John 19, 31. Did you get that? The first day of unleavened bread and the last day of unleavened bread, that's the 15th and 21st, are called holy convocation or high Sabbath. You treat them as if they were a weekly Sabbath. They're not a weekly Sabbath, but you treat them that way. In that seven-day period of unleavened bread, there are three Sabbaths. Two of them are high Sabbath and one's a weekly Sabbath. It's really important. You will not know that unless you study Leviticus 23. On the 18th of Niacin, of unleavened bread, there was, after the weekly Sabbath of unleavened bread, the ne very next day, which we call Sunday, the first day of the week, is first fruits. It was on Sunday the 18th that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and is referred to by Paul as the first fruits of the resurrection. That's why Jesus Christ is referred to, like in 1 Corinthians 15, as the first fruits of the resurrection. Leviticus, here's where you find it, Leviticus 23, 15 through 22. Now you've got the 18th, the day of the resurrection of Christ, which is called the festival of first fruits. Now you've been again counting from first fruits. You count 50 days and you have the Jewish festival of Pentecost where you have the church begin. The advent of the Holy Spirit and the church age begins. How important is that to our history as Christians? It's enormous. Jesus is fulfilling Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Here's the third point. The first three Passovers in Jewish history are really important. The first Passover in Jewish history was when Israel left Egypt. The second Passover of Jewish history, the second Passover in history, Jewish history, was when they stopped in the desert of Sinai. The third Passover in Jewish history that's important is when Israel entered the promised land. Three Passovers are recorded. These first three historical Passovers are important for the student of the Word of God. Now, many of you may not be a student. Hopefully, we will excite you to become a student of the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you why these first three were important. Because rules and regulations connected to the Passover that Jesus must fulfill at Golgotha are given. It takes three of them to get all of the rules and regulations connected. So I went in and did that study and laid them out on the paper for you. For example, the first Jewish Passover occurred in Egypt at twilight 
Exodus 12, 6, which is between 3 and 5 a.m. in the morning, just prior to Israel leaving Egypt. You can study this in chapters uh, Exodus chapters 11 and 12. It was in the chapter 12, 11 through 13, verses 40 through 42 as well, where this Passover is identified as the Lord's Passover. This is the Lord's Passover. Why did they call it Passover? A couple reasons. We're going to look at the first Passover. Eight regulations were established that were important to the Passover. First, the slaying of the lamb, Exodus 12, 6. Then the lamb's blood put over the doorpost of the homes in Egypt. Exodus 12, 12 through 14, which is discussed in the Last Supper. And by the way, it was their Last Supper, the 12th chapter of Exodus, verse 8. The first and last days of unleavened, blood, of unleavened bread were identified as holy convocations or high Sabbaths, Exodus 12, 16. The unleavened bread a festival celebrates the freedom from Egypt by the grace of God. Exodus 12, 17. The last of the eight days in 12, 18 is when the death angel passed over Egypt. If there was no blood of the lamb, not any kind of blood, the lamb's blood, specific, was not found on the doorpost of the house, i.e. a cross. The firstborn of man and animal died in the land of Egypt. The death angel would pass over, and thus we have the word Passover. Exodus 12 29 and 30, also Hebrews eleven twenty eight. 28. The final thing that was declared in the first Jewish Passover was no bones of a lamb could be broken. It disqualified the lamb, the lamb's blood. This is recorded in Exodus 12, 46, and recorded by John in regard to Jesus on the cross in John 19, 33 through 36. That's the first Passover. And all of that is now laid out and must be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. The second Passover gave us two additional regulations. It separated clean from unclean and the alien, how to deal with the alien or the foreigner. Second Passover. Four additional regulations were given in the third Passover when they entered the promised land. This is found, oh, by the way, the second Passover in the desert of Sinai is recorded in Numbers 9, 1 through 14. It, it, we discover that Niacin is the first month of the Jewish year because of leaving Egypt in the Exodus. They started a whole new calendar. They were no longer under Egyptian calendar. They came up with their own calendar. Now we have the third Passover, that is entering the promised land of Joshua 5, 6 through 12, also recorded in Exodus 12, 24 through 28. We have four additional regulations added to the Passover. The first one was the Exodus generation that left Egypt would die the sin unto death. We have that in Joshua 5, 5 and 6. And this idea is recorded in 1 John 5, 16. The second generation, the children of the first Exodus generation, the second generation are going to be circumcised to identify the importance of the seed of Messiah, Galatians uh, 3, 16. This is recorded in Joshua 5, 7 through 9. The 15th of Niacin, manna, on the 15th of Niacin, listen to me now, 
the 14th, 15th day of Nisan is the first day of unleavened bread. Listen, listen to this. All the manna ceased. When they entered the promised land, all the manna of 40 years of wilderness ceased. Why? Because God graced with supply based on the, entering the promised land. The abundant life, not to get by life, not, not life to get by. Many of you Christians, you live the life of get by. You ought to live John 10.10, 10, the abundant life. There's an abundant life. The victorious life in Christ. You, you've got to understand this stuff. This is the stuff Jesus Christ must fulfill to be the Messiah. The first three, the first three Passovers in Jewish history are really important because of the rules and regulations assigned to it that were kept or in orderly fashion because of their importance that Jesus has to fulfill. I mean, as simple as maybe no bones broken of the lamb. Where did that idea come from? Come from these regulations. You really, you really need to become a student of the word of God. You need to pay attention. You need to visit us. You need to study with us. I have a wonderful congregation that pays me to study, study, and study and bring this out to them where they can see it. And I'm thankful for that. I am enormously thankful for that. But listen, all this digging out and showing you all these things falls on deaf ears if you're not positive to the word of God. You've got to become a student of the word of God to be able to put all these pieces in this great puzzle together and come out the picture of the historical Jesus Christ. This is important. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't play with this. Now, the fourth and final point for my lesson today. The per first Passover in the land was under the leadership of Joshua. His name is Salvation. The first Passover in the land, that is the third Passover of the history, the first Passover in the land under the leadership of Joshua, salvation, will prepare for the last Passover in the land under Jesus, the salvation. They get that, Joshua and Jesus. One is talking about prophetic Messiah, and the other is the fulfillment of it, Joshua and Jesus. You can study this in Matthew 27, 50 and 51. It would be well worth your time. The last Passover in the land, Jesus Christ, will prepare for the first Eucharist in the church of Jesus Christ everywhere in the world. Think about that. Think about that. The Eucharist is for every believer in the world, not just some. Not just some believers. It's for all believers. What Christ did at Calvary in fulfilling all the regulations connected with the Passover unleavened bread, first fruits Pentecost business. We are benefited by every bit of that by grace. Whether you knew all these regulations he had to fulfill to, fo to be the Messiah. You got them all anyhow. <laughs> you got them all. You know why? Because of God's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. In this marvelous package of 50 things you receive in salvation, this is the gift you got. The 50 things. The Last Supper became the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper became the Eucharist of the church. Luke 22, 19 and 20. The church Eucharist also has regulations. How about that? The New Covenant Eucharist has regulations. And they're very important for us as a church. What are those regulations? Let me mention five. Let me mention five to you in closing. 
we're commanded, all believers who have an opportunity to take part in the Eucharist are commanded to take part in the Eucharist. There's a command connected with bread. You're to take the bread with thanksgiving in your heart. The giving of thanks. The giving of thanks. You're commanded. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. It means everybody who has the opportunity as a believer to have the opportunity around here. We do it the first month, the first Sunday of every month. Here I am the first Sunday of every month, and I haven't been able to do that because my people are under an edict of the state. To stay home. The first one we've missed. I've been here 45 years. We're commanded to take the bread with thanksgiving. We are told in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, this is my body. Just like he said in, 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 in Luke 22. This is my body, which is for you. Do that's a command. Do this in remembrance of me. There are four doctrines that are connected to it. The body of Christ, virgin birth. The body that went to the cross, impeccable. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The hypostatic man, the only begotten son of God, taken on human flesh. Undemanding deity and true humanity in one person forever. The, the, the Lord Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of God the Father and everything that he is seated with all authority in heaven and earth. We become. He's a son. We're a son. He's a priest. We're a priest. He's eternal life. We're eternal life. Do you understand the power of the reason you should give thanks when you take part in the bread? The second regulation is the command to take the cup. The second command is to take the cup with thanksgiving. He writes, Paul writes, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This records the nine doctrines uh, that are involved in the propitious salvation of Jesus Christ, redemption, regeneration, etc. You can find this in our 50 things on our website, doctrinalstudies.com. We're commanded to take the bread with thanksgiving. We're commanded to take the cup with thanksgiving. Then we're told about participation. A third regulation, participation, participation, that is the bread and the cup with thanksgiving, is proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Now think about that. We're to live this fulfilled life in Christ, the first coming, with anticipation of the second coming. Our anticipation of the second coming of Christ, and we call it the rapture. But listen, it'll either come by rapture or death. And both should be comforting to you. We don't mourn as the world mourns with death. We celebrate the victory won at Calvary for us. There's a fourth. The participant must self-examine himself, must examine himself regarding personal sin and confession of that sin to the Lord before eating or drinking. That's recorded in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29, and 1 John 1, 9. And finally, the final regulation of the Eucharist, participants who participate with personal sin in their life having been warned of it in congregational setting, will be disciplined by the Lord as a believer. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 through 32. I thank you today in our first study of the history of Messianic Passover. Let me ask you this. Do you understand the significance of Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead? The significance is he's the Passover lamb that came to die for the sins of the world. What would that be? Adam's sin, Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21. He who knew, listen, Christ who knew no sin became sin for us. What sin? Listen, two, Adam's sin, that's 
that's imputed to every person born as a human being. For by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death spread to all men. That's a spiritual concept. Separation from God in time. If you die in that condition, you'll be separated from God in eternity. That's, it. That's just the way it is. And so I encourage you today, believe that Jesus died for your sins. The sins that are associated with Adam's sin. You're alienated from God. You're under spiritual death. You're condemned. Not because of something you've done, because who you are in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and Adam all die, and Christ all are made alive. You need to understand that. You need to get saved because of that. You're saved when you believe that Jesus died to remove that sin barrier was buried on third day, raised from the dead. You believe that's called the gospel? That gospel is the power of God, Romans 1.16, is the power of God to save everyone who believes. And so I encourage you to believe that. I encourage you to believe that and be saved. Be saved by the authority of the word of God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. The only boast goes to God who put his son on the cross for our sins to be saved by grace. It is a gift, not of works. And so I give you a moment today. You know, you, the sinner's prayer is the prayer that you pray. It's not what I pray. I don't pray a sinner's prayer for you. You pray the sinner's prayer for yourself. You tell God that I know I'm a sinner because of Adam's sin, no matter what I've done in my life. I'm a sinner because of Adam's sin, Romans 5, 12 through 21. You tell him that I believe that Jesus died for my sins to remove me from the despair of going to hell when I die, rather to go, now I go to heaven. You tell him that stuff. That's your prayer. Thank him that he sent his son to die in our place to take our punishment so that we could have the privileges of salvation by grace as a gift. The sinner prayer is your prayer, but it needs to be made. It needs to be made today. That is my prayer for you. Father, we thank you today for these have come our way to study with us. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this. We pray, Father, that those who understand the sinner's prayer would pray that prayer. They are the sinner, and it is their prayer that meets their need as God offers you Grace, salvation, grace, gifted salvation for your life. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. Christ did all the work that you might have it by grace in Jesus' name. Amen.